How do you manage transposition of the great arteries when neonatal diagnosis is difficult? By Dr. Paravathi Iyer. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Parvati Iyer, and I work as Director of Pediatric Intensive Care at the Fortis Escorts Heart Institute in New Delhi in India. Today, I'm going to speak on how you manage transposition of great arteries when neonatal diagnosis is difficult. Late presentation of transposition intact septum is not uncommon in India or in Asia. Management of transposition of great arteries when neonatal diagnosis is difficult has been an evolving story. Today, our current approach has evolved over the last 20 years. Surgical options include primary arterial switch, two-stage switch, or the sending operation, which is the atrial switch. The options in late transposition intact septum include these three procedures. There is today level two evidence that the primary arterial switch is feasible and safe up to eight weeks of age. However, our preference is the primary arterial switch in infants up to three months of age, even though they are often accompanied by a transient and often very severe postoperative low cardiac output state. So the outline of my talk today is going to be a brief fact sheet on India, how we stabilize, who to switch, that is till what age do we switch, when do we switch after initial presentation, and how we manage a post-operative late primary arterial switch. India today is perceived as a booming IT economy, but it's also a land of a billion. With a huge burden of congenital heart disease and about 11,000 instances of transposition of great arteries are born each year. It's also a land of disparities and grinding poverty, where 80% earn less than $2 per day. And this is because of the two Indias that coexist together, one of newfound wealth and another of grinding poverty. It's also a land where the human developmental indices continue to be abysmal, so pediatric cardiac care is thus not a public health care priority. This is a map of my country. And even in 2016, the majority of the pediatric cardiac centers are really private centers. What this means is that most families have to pay for pediatric cardiac care. And today, to bridge the gap, the increasing number of free surgeries done in private hospitals. So this is my institution, the Fortis Escorts Heart Institute in the north of India in New Delhi. The pediatric program had its inception in 1995. It's actually a 350 bed heart center set up in 1988, which has mostly adult and pediatric cardiac patients. Today, our caseload is between 650 to 700 surgeries per year. And out of these, only 50% pay all costs incurred, 15% pay nothing, which really means that we all have to be tremendously cost conscious. This is a panoramic view of our intensive care unit. It's a 15-bedded pediatric intensive care unit, and over the years, we've had to stretch ourselves. This is a unit which initially serviced 450 surgeries a year, and now servicing nearly 700 surgeries per year. There is a lot written about the benefits of antenatal diagnosis of transposition intact ventricular septum in reducing neonatal morbidity and mortality. Likewise, I draw your attention to Kate Brown's paper from Great Ormond Street, who showed that delayed diagnosis of congenital heart disease in neonates is associated with significant increase in in-hospital mortality, ECLS requirement, and perioperative ventilation. In India, in 2016, we have increasing number of sicker and complex infants presenting late with transposition of great arteries, total anomalous pulmonary veins, and al -Kappa. They present with varying degrees of systemic ventricular dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension and invariably present with circulatory collapse and varying degrees of multi-organ failure syndrome. Many of them have lactates up to 25 millimoles per liter accompanied by evolving occult sepsis. So the average neonatal infant with transposition often presents with a combination of cardiogenic and septic shock.
associated with significant evolving brain injury. Who then should we offer surgery to and when should the surgery be done? There are no easy guidelines in literature and I have many painful bitter lessons to share in the next few minutes. Occult or evolving preoperative multidrug resistance um, Multidrug resistant gram negative or fungal sepsis is usually accompanied by huge costs, both in terms of postoperative mortality and postoperative morbidity. They're usually associated with varying degrees of capillary leak, which increases the length of hospital stay from 45 to 60 days. This slide illustrates the devastating impact of sepsis on outcomes in primary arterial switch. This is an 11-day-old who was sick at presentation, had a post-operative length of stay of 27 days. Another 25-day-old IVF twin had treated fungal sepsis but died on the 52nd post-operative day. Another 31-day-old sick infant who presented with lactic acidosis and desaturation was transferred on prostaglandin and ventilation, underwent urgent balloon septostomy, was septic but was discharged, underwent arterial switch at 41 days of age but had a post-operative length of stay of 37 days. So the costs were enormous and the costs ranged between $10,000 to $25,000. On the other hand, Transposition intact septum who were much sicker at presentation with lactate levels of 21 and 22 millimoles per liter with profound metabolic acidosis and even multi-organ failure did had much better outcomes when they were not when there was no accompanying sepsis. So this 35 day old, 59 day old who was switched at 45 and 69 days of age and another 52 day old who underwent arterial switch at 54 days of age had a post-operative length of stay of only 10 to 13 days despite significant post-operative left ventricular dysfunction with LVF ranging from 25 to 35% accompanied by surges in left atrial pressure up to 25 millimeters. And this was, mind you, without recourse to mechanical support. The costs in TAVE were much more reasonable, ranging from $4,000 to $6,000. Is balloon atrial septostomy routine in such infants? Following this paper, this is a paper published in circulation which showed the adverse effects of balloon atrial septostomy. Our cardiologists are reluctant. So currently our policy is we try and avoid a septostomy and after some measure of stabilization, we proceed straight away to an arterial switch. More recently, there has been more available data on the use of atrial stenting for stabilization and for enhancing intercirculatory mixing in transposition of great vessels. An example of this is stabilization by atrial stenting, which we have found particularly useful for bailout in sepsis. These are two instances where we used atrial stenting. One, a 66-day-old 66 septic collapsed infant, and another, a nine-and-a-half-month-old transposition with LVOTO. This baby was septic, had consumptive coagulopathy, multi-organ failure syndrome, and an intracranial parietal bleed. Atrial stenting was used for stabilization and this infant was discharged and arterial switch was performed after two months and the length of stay was only 12 days. There is some data on duct recanalization and duct stenting from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi in India. But this was accompanied by equivocal results and was not particularly very successful. There's a plethora of literature on neurological injury and some bitter, painful lessons that we've learned I'd like to share with you. We had a three-day-old who presented with circulatory collapse and lactic acidosis, had a normal head ultrasound after close evaluation. Eight days later, that's on the 11th day, he underwent an uneventful switch. But unfortunately, the baby did not wake up and died later. And this was the CT scan, which shows extensive hypoxic changes. Thereafter, our policy is to do a screening in neuroimaging in the form of an MRI or a CT scan. And today, that's our current policy if any infant presents with circulatory collapse before they go for surgery. So 
Our risk factors in late transposition intact septum include varying degrees of preoperative brain injury, which necessitates meticulous neurointensive care. All of these children survived. So what we found was that the more we looked, the more we discovered. And this is in keeping with Dr. John Becker's paper on preoperative brain injury in newborn infants with transposition of great arteries. So in summary, how do we stabilize infants with transposition intact septum. We use standard modalities, prostaglandin E1, airway stabilization, volume adjustments, and various forms of pharmacological support. But there's a tremendous focus on a detailed septic workup along with a careful neuroimaging. Most infants after stabilization proceed straight for surgery in the form of a primary arterial switch. They undergo a balloon atrial septostomy only if they are very sick after which they go for surgery. We use atrial stent as a bailout in sepsis, and these infants are usually discharged with a plan for surgery later after discharge. How does one identify regressed left ventricle? There are innumerable echocardiographic parameters listed in literature. The most popular ones are left ventricular posterior wall thickness less than three millimeters and a left ventricular mass index of less than 35 gram per square meter. There are other hemodynamic parameters and an intraoperative response to trial pulmonary artery banding has been recently described. But what is our practice? Up to two months of age, our surgeons do not look at the echo. More than two months of age, they prefer to eyeball and go by a gut feeling to take a decision whether a primary arterial switch is feasible. So how do we manage transposition intact septum when neonatal diagnosis is difficult? Till what age do we actually offer a primary arterial switch? Till the year 2000, under 21 days, the babies went for an arterial switch. For 21 days to six weeks, uh, the options were rapid two-stage switch or ascending operation, and beyond six weeks of age, ascending operation was routinely offered to the parents. With this, the arterial switch mortality was to 10%, and with ascending mortality of around 4%. Currently, from 2002 onwards, we've been slowly pushing the boundaries of the arterial switch. And from 2006 onwards, under two months of age, a primary arterial switch is routinely performed. Between two to three months of age, it's usually a primary arterial switch. Beyond three months of age, the options are a primary arterial switch or ascending with a loose pulmonary artery band, depending on left ventricular configuration. And all of this is with minimal recourse to mechanical support. We do not use the two-stage switch at all currently. Um, this kind of a huge paradigm shift was feasible because we were inspired by this paper published by Great Ormond Street, which showed that the left ventricle is adaptable and maintains the potential for systemic work. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, in select instances, primary switch is feasible even in much older infants with transposition intact septum. This is a 76-day-old infant from Uzbekistan and a 235-day-old from Iraq. Both of them had prepared left ventricles. They underwent a primary arterial switch with a length of stay of only 13 to 14 days, even though there was post-operative left ventricular dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension. There was no associated sepsis, but they had surges in left atrial pressure up to 20 millimeters. What did we find? We found that they were accompanied by major aortopulmary collaterals which were addressed. It's important to diagnose this preoperatively, otherwise they can often be associated with profuse postoperative endotracheal bleeding and prolonged intensive care and hospital stay. So delayed left ventricular involution in transposition intact septum um, may be associated with either large aortopulmary collaterals, a large PDA, a dynamic or resectable LVOTO, or a delayed fall of high neonatal pulmonary vascular resistance. Uh, delayed left ventricular involution allows for safe late primary arterial switch. However, if we find that the left ventricle is prepared, this needs very careful evaluation. This is a seven and a half month old who had a prepared left ventricle. He underwent cardiac catheterization and was found to have high pulmonary artery pressures. He underwent a successful primary arterial switch under cover of sildenafil. Going back to the Great Ormond Street data 
on delayed primary switch. Um, they looked at 105 infants older than 21 days of age with a median age of 28 days with an age range of 21 to 185 days. The in-hospital mortality was 5.5%, ECLS requirement of 3.6%. When the results were compared with that of the earlier switch, of early switch, in-hospital mortality and ECLS requirement were comparable. Post-operative ventilation and length of stay were longer in those who underwent a late primary switch. More recently, this is a paper published from India. Um, this data showed that primary arterial switch beyond six weeks of age was associated with an early mortality of 9.2% and a fairly high ECLS requirement of nearly 20%. Postoperative management of late primary arterial switch is associated with often profound low cardiac output state. Published data recommends either early or elective mechanical support, but these are not feasible in busy programs in Asia which function on a tight shoestring budget. So then what are the options? Uh, inspired by the paper from Great Ormond Street, in 2004, we looked at the modality of aggressive afterload reduction for management of postoperative late primary arterial switch. These infants had a median age of 55 days, and we found that in-hospital mortality was comparable in both the groups, both early switch and late switch. Primary and secondary outcomes were comparable, and none of the infants needed me uh, mechanical support. Ventilatory CPAP requirement and ICU stay were also similar in both the groups. So in summary, till what age do we offer switch, and when should the surgery be done? Up to two months of age, an arterial switch primarily can be offered regardless of the echo findings. Beyond two months of age, it needs to be carefully individualized. All of this entails a real judgment call or a balancing act. Is sepsis adequately treated vis-a-vis -vis how much further will the left ventricle regress while we wait? And over the years, we've been learning as we go along. This is a small case story of a 50-day-old 2.9 kilo baby with transposition and regressed left ventricle. This baby was referred to us from an another town, was found to have only minimal lactic acidosis on admission, was hypothyroid for which thyroxine was commenced. The left ventricle showed evidence of regression. He underwent a primary arterial switch was, which was uneventful. The focus during surgery is on speedy, accurate surgery with minimal bypass and cross clamp times. Separation from CPB was achieved on dibutamine and milrinone. Epicardial echo was satisfactory and the baby was transferred with stable hemodynamics to the intensive care unit. The intraoperative measures included afterload reduction with phenoxybenzamine, siting of peritoneal dialysis catheter, and the sternal closure was deferred in view of anticipated low cardiac output state, hemodynamic instability, and postoperative fluid retention. As I said on arrival, the baby arrived with stable hemodynamics with lactates of 3.3 millimoles, Three hours later, there was a surge in left atrial pressures, which was managed conservatively with manual ventilation, sedation, muscle relaxation, and initiation of nitroglycerine, after which the left atrial pressure stabilized at about nine millimeters. Over the next couple of hours, the baby experienced intermittent hypotension with drop in blood pressures to the low 40s. At this time, the mixed venous oxygen saturation was 72% with a lactate of 0.9, ionic calcium was 0.9. This was managed with gentle volume augmentation with the target left atrial pressures of 9 to 11 and calcium infusion as an inotropy, the target ionic calcium being 1.1 to 1.3 millimoles per litre. The first postoperative day, the baby experienced worsening hemodynamics with tachycardia, further drop in blood pressure, lactates of 4.5, and a mild drop in mixed venous oxygen saturation. So what is happening and what do we do, need to do next? What has happened is that the cardiac index has dropped, and this is in keeping with published literature, which shows that there is a dip in cardiac index, which occurs six to 12 hours after cardiac surgery. 
And this is Jill Vanosky's published data. What did the echo show? The echo showed a concomitant drop in left ventricular function. Now this slide illustrates the intensive care course after the late primary arterial switch in this 50 day old infant. You can see that in the first few hours there was a surge in left atrial pressure to 16 millimeters. Subsequently, there was a drop in blood pressures to 30 millimeters on the first post-operative day. On the second post-operative day, the left atrial pressures were better, were between 5 to 9, and the blood pressures were marginally better. Fourth post-operative day witnessed a stable left atrium and much better mean arterial pressures. Thereafter, the sternum was successfully closed on the fifth post-operative day. Weaning was commenced on the sixth post-operative day and the baby was successfully extubated to elective CPAP on the seventh post-operative day. So, to look more closely at exactly what we did, the baby arrived in the intensive care unit on dibutamine, milrinone and phenoxybenzamine. The surge in left atrial pressure was addressed with nitroglycerine and increase in sedation. Muscle relaxation was added and gentle hypothermia was initiated. The drop in blood pressure was managed with gentle volume augmentation and a calcium infusion. Subsequently, physiological steroids and noradrenaline were also added, after which the baby stabilized, the sternum was closed, the baby was extubated. The subsequent course was one of rapid recovery. The infant was extubated on the seventh postoperative day, was off all hemodynamic support by the tenth postoperative day, and was successfully discharged by the fifteenth postoperative day. After discharge on the 33rd postoperative day, the echocardiogram showed a significantly improved left ventricular function and this is the picture of the little baby with his mother. So how did we improve cardiac output in these infants? And this is by harnessing physiological maneuvers which are well described literature, appropriate preload optimization, and afterload reduction. Afterload reduction constitutes the mainstay of management and has been shown to be of much greater benefit in severe LV dysfunction than as compared to inotropy. The other adjuvant modalities include calcium infusion, corticosteroid use in physiological doses, thyroxine supplementation for accompanying hypothyroidism and the use of non-invasive ventilation for LV dysfunction to enhance or augment cardiac output. This is the care pathway that we use for LCOS management without ACLS. It's systematic, it's a protocolized approach and it harnesses diverse strategies but all of which are basics refined. It's dependent upon volume adjustments, pharmacological support, surgical strategies, and the use of ventilation, PEEP, and non-invasive ventilation to optimize cardiac output. Synergistically, we use all measures to reduce metabolic demands, and these include analgesia, sedation, muscle relaxation, and gentle hypothermia. Important and common pitfalls which need to be carefully avoided are use of large rapid fluid boluses to increase the blood pressure, chasing low blood pressures if well perfused, the use of high-dose catecholamines and a premature extubation. High-dose catecholamines to be, need to be consciously avoided because of the deleterious effects of catecholamines they tend to cause catecholamine resistant hypotension and enhance myocardial apoptosis, so they need to be consciously avoided. What are our outcomes? Between January 2002 to March 2016, 214 primary arterial switch was done for transposition intact septum. The early mortality was actually higher in the early group, in the group less than three weeks, which was 8.8%, and in the late group, it was 4.5%. The ECLS requirement was comparable in both the groups, and in the late group, there was only one mortality due to primary left ventricular failure, and the other mortalities were unrelated to the heart. So, in summary, the intensive care course after a late primary arterial switch at 50 to 100 days is highly predictable. 
So the management really depends upon the pattern recognition. We need to remember that the first 48 hours are extremely unstable with surges in left atrial pressure and periods of hypotension. The third postoperative day is usually more stable and by the fourth to the fifth postoperative day in most instances the sternum can be comfortably closed. By the sixth to seventh postoperative day the infant can be extubated to CPAP. And the postoperative length of stay usually ranges from between 11 to 21 days. 89 infants have undergone late primary arterial switch. The median age was 68 days. And what is gratifying is that the last six years there were zero deaths. And this protocolized care pathway for low cardiac output has been found to have reproducible results in many other units in, in, in India as well as in Bangladesh. We've also been emboldened by the fact that our 30-day mortality has improved over the last 11 years and this is also a reflection of better LCOS management. One million children are born with congenital heart disease each year. And what is sobering is that the majority of those who are born with heart disease live in low income and lower middle income countries. So the implications to clinical practice are tremendous and global. These modalities are cost saving, they avoid potential complications of ECLS in units manned by inexperienced medical and nursing staff. To quote Kofi Annan, we live in a beautiful world, but healthcare is inequitable. So there's tremendous potential for these modalities in humanitarian missions. So to conclude, management of transposition of great arteries, intact ventricular septum when neonatal diagnosis is difficult, continues to be an evolving story. Decision on who and when to switch has to be very carefully individualized. Severe postoperative low cardiac output state in most instances can be managed successfully without recourse to ECLS or mechanical support. It needs to be seen, however, how much we can push these boundaries and to determine how old is really safe. All of this might just seem like a drop in the ocean, but we tell ourselves every day that it is every drop which makes the mighty ocean. At the end, I'd also like to acknowledge my team who is our, also our family, for all the work that was feasible. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening in. I appreciate your time. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.